Today we're going to be talking about the webinar creation of a university and community partnership to address the opioid epidemic, translating evidence to practice. I'm pleased to announce Dr. Amy Thompson is here to um, provide us this education. Um, first of all, just want to get through a few little um, I, things we need to talk about, first of all. Um, so this webinar is designated for Certified Health Education Specialists, which is CHES, or the Master Certified Health Education Specialist, MCHES, to receive one Category 1 Continuing Education Contact Hour. So the cost for this is free for Iowa SOFI members. It's a great benefit for being a member. Um, and non-Iowa SOFI members, the cost is $10. Um, if you haven't paid for your credits today or are not a member, you can go to the Iowa SOFI website and click on membership. And then from there, you can go ahead and pay for those CHES credits for today. So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Amy Thompson. Dr. Amy Thompson is the Vice Provost of Faculty Affairs at the University of Toledo. She's the former UT Faculty Senate President, has co-chaired the UT Sexual Assault Prevention Task Force, and is the current co-chair for UT Opioid Task Force. Dr. Thompson received her BS in Public Health from Central Michigan University, her MS in ED in Public Health, and her PhD in Health Education from the University of Toledo. In addition to her 10 years of service at the University of Toledo, she was also a faculty member at Mississippi State University and at Kent State University. Dr. Thompson is the former national president of Eta Eta Sigma Gamma, health education honorary, and is the current national advocacy trustee for the Society for Public Health Education, also known as SOFI. She has published over 70 peer-reviewed journal articles and has secured nearly $800,000 in grant funding. Her work has been presented and published both nationally and internationally. So I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Amy Thompson. You can go ahead and submit questions throughout her presentation using the chat function, or else afterwards you can also unmute yourself and ask questions directly. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Thompson. Hi everybody, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, let, let us know if you cannot. Thank you so much for, for having us here today. This is a very, very uh, important topic. I'm guessing that many of you are interested in this uh, because you are a public health professional working in the area of opiate prevention or community partnerships. So uh, in terms of looking at why we wanted to present this, uh, this is my experience as a uh, person at my university asked to strengthen the relationships uh, with the community uh, that we could offer partnerships and resources and, and really be able to, uh, I guess, overall improve the efforts in our community for uh, opiate uh, prevention and treatment and such. So with that said, I just want to make sure if we could get the slides advanced here. Tiffany, I, I'm actually not able to advance the slides. If you could do that, that would be great. If you could do that. I don't, I don't seem to have control on the slides. You could just hold on for one second while we work on that. Sure, I'll go ahead and pull up those slides for you. Okay, thank you. There we go. Ah, that helps. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So the name of our uh, talk today is Creation of a University and Community Partnership into Addressing the Opiate Epidemic, Translating Evidence to Practice. And again, I uh, have been very active uh, in this area over the last year or so in my community at, and at the university. Next slide. So today, uh, in the next hour or so, we're going to talk about the impact on of opiates on the community and what are the benefits of a university and community partnership to address the opiate epidemic. 
So not that I need to uh, educate any of you on the role that opiates has played uh, in the United States. Uh, I am in Ohio, so we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in, in my state specifically. But many of you know that drug overdoses and opiate-involved deaths continue to increase in the United States, uh, especially uh, drug uh, deaths from drug overdose. Um, both men and women, all races and adults of nearly all ages, we're seeing some um, deaths increased within those age groups. In fact, I was talking to a coroner the other day in our community. I said, who's the youngest person that you've had, you know, die from a heroin overdose? And he said, 12 years old. And he said, and I see people in their 80s. In fact, one of the areas that is causing, uh, uh, I guess, a lot of attention is the fact that um, older adults are often dying and they're assuming it's, you know, old age or, you know, it's just a natural function. But in fact, a lot of them uh, could have taken opiates prior to their death or too many of them. So uh, that's a, a, a unique uh, happening throughout the country. Also, uh, more than three out of five drug overdose deaths involve an opiate. We're seeing that because of this increase, when you look at unintentional injuries in general, that uh, drug overdoses have now surpassed motor vehicles as a leading cause of unintentional death. And we've seen exponentially the number of overdose, overdose deaths from opiates uh, really over five to seven times increased since 1999. So again, to put this into perspective, because I think we look at these large you know, numbers and it's hard to wrap our head around them sometimes. But in 2016, uh, and, and this holds true to today, roughly the same number, uh, 116 people die every single day from an opiate-related uh, overdose. We have over 11.5 million people misusing prescription opiates. Um, I think you would find most of the people that, uh, you know, become addicted, never in, in, you know, intended to become addicted. Some of them started with surgeries and of course getting prescriptions or some people you know, switched from um, other drugs of choice to uh, opiates and then the powerful addiction occurring there. Um, we've had uh, estimates of 2.1 million people having some type of opiate use disorder. Over 948,000 people using heroin Substantial costs in the form of uh, economic costs is estimated in a given year around $504 billion in economic costs. In fact, in my area, we're actually working on a study on an economic impact study in our region to see what opiate addiction, overdose and death is doing to our um, finances. For example, think about first responders. Um, in many cases, there's not enough, you know, police and fire to respond to uh, the number of uh, overdoses. In fact, it was very controversial in my state. There was one sheriff that said he was going to use the three strikes and you're out rule for responding to that person for uh, opiate overdoses, that they wouldn't come out after the third time. Um, so, again, we're seeing lots of uh, overdoses and in any given year, lots of new people trying heroin for the very first time. So when you look at the landscape, and I, I want to be clear that this is obviously a public health problem in every community, but we do see some states that have um, higher drug overdose uh, compared to others. West Virginia uh, has a death rate of 57.8 per 100,000, and our claim to fame in Ohio is we're number two at 46.3 per 100,000, followed by Pennsylvania, D.C., and Kentucky. So where I live in Toledo, Ohio is right in the thick of it. So to give you an idea of, again, the level of what we're seeing in our community and the, I guess, needs of resources and partnerships, in 2007, uh, looking back, there were 631 deaths in Ohio from opiates. In 2017, which is the last really up-to-date data that we have because it takes often one to two years to have uh, all of the deaths um, compiled is about 4,162. 
and the vast majority of these deaths involve fentanyl. In fact, about 82% of the unintentional overdose deaths involve this drug. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the potency that, you know, basically uh, a particle the size of a, a salt crystal is enough to kill somebody. <clears throat> In fact, we heard of a case uh, not too long ago where um, there was a young person who was using heroin in a, at the grandmother's house and left some powder residual on the coffee table. And the grandmother came along and was just, you know, how you see dust and you kind of brush it off. Well, that was actually heroin laced with fentanyl and the grandmother died as a result of coming in contact with fentanyl because it's, it's fat soluble. So again, looking at some of the data in our state and, and the necessity to try to do everything we can, you can see gradually how that there's been an increase in uh, opiate overdose rates in Ohio. Now, if you look at, for example, uh, and you, you, you have heroin, prescription opiates, and then all opiates. We actually have seen a reduction, uh, at least in 2017, of opiate overdose rates from heroin, but that's actually then increased in the level of fentanyl. So that, that's somewhat misleading and our deaths are, are going up, but those are attributed more from fentanyl uh, and not heroin. Of course, we're also seeing things like um, people uh, cutting things like cocaine with fentanyl, uh, meth with fentanyl. So this isn't just necessarily a, a heroin issue. So as a result of what was going on in our community, our president, Dr. Sharon Gaber, uh, charged myself, uh, I'm in the, the pink shirt, uh, and Dr. Linda Lewandowski, the Dean of the College of Nursing, uh, to do something about this. And we were charged with really three things, looking at what's going on at the university in terms of research, education, community service, uh, that the faculty, staff, and students were engaged with. How could we become a partner in the region uh, to assist and meet with government leaders and create these um, community partnerships? And then look at possible funding sources. In this particular area, I will tell you, there just seems to be a lot of siloed work. And so because of that, um, you know, there's redundancy. Um, sometimes there's overlapping of programs and resources. Uh, so really a need to kind of have some, some focal point, some beacon of leadership on this issue so it can be more coordinated and to eliminate things that are redundant. So steps in creating a task force. Many of you probably work in public health uh, and have had to be involved with some type of coalition before or task force. Um, one of the first things we had to do, because I will tell you, my, my area of background is actually in, in, in gun violence and in advocacy and breast cancer. So I know those are varied, but uh, drugs really was not one of my areas. <laughs> so I had to become quickly versed when the president asked me uh, to take this role uh, and spearhead the efforts at the University of Toledo. So I think this would be much easier for somebody coming from, you know, a community uh, background or research background uh, in uh, opiates or drugs. And so we had to kind of do what I would call a listening tour and find out who was doing what, who were the players, who were the partners, what did that look like? Um, what is our internal existing re resources that we had at UT? Uh, that was a challenge in itself because here's the thing. Coming from a public health background, I tend to think about more things that are public health or medical based. So, you know, obviously I was tuned in that we have a detox center. Uh, I was tuned in that we had people doing some work in behavioral health. Uh, people doing some prevention education, but that was really my narrow scope of things. I didn't, I didn't really think of it in a larger scale of things like, you know, how is pharmacy addressing this, for example, in pain management? How is nursing doing this in terms of uh, tra training their clinicians or medicine because we have a, a medical school? Or what about um, 
the environmental impact of opiates. We actually at the University of Toledo have a water quality task force. And because if you know anything about Toledo, we have the wonderful green algal bloom problem. Uh, so uh, we have a, a lot of resources that look into water quality. Well, if you've been following anything in the media, there's concerns about the level of opiates uh, being an issue in the water supply. In fact, off the coast, I think of Washington State, they were finding mussels that were testing positive for opiates in the water. When people throw their drugs away, uh, that goes somewhere. When people take in a drug and use the bathroom, that goes somewhere. Um, so, you know, other areas, criminal justice, for example. Uh, so we found, uh, as we were looking at our own internal resources and the faculty we would want to involve, our list went from, you know, who we thought might be eight or 10 people to probably about 75 people. And so this was really very involved. It, it took things like asking around, and I'll talk a little bit more with this, um, you know, using our librarian to find out who might have published in the area of opiates. Uh, and then once we kind of were trying to wrap our, our he heads around what was going on at the university, you know, what is already going on in the community, right? There's faith-based groups, there's uh, other individuals that are doing, you know, great work in the community. We didn't want to overstep them and, you know, necessarily go into their territory. But where would be the gaps in services? Where are some things that we could make the biggest difference uh, in terms of, of need? And then who are, the, who are the key stakeholders and what is their role in this? And we learned very quickly that one of the biggest stakeholders, for example, was the health department, that they were already doing a lot in this area or the Mental Health and Recovery Board. Uh, we found that they were one of the um, largest, um, I guess, entities where grants would come in. So, you know, looking at them and their role. So what did we do? Just to give you some more specific direction, if, if you know, again, if you're working in this area, you're thinking about this, we met with everybody we could. Um, so we met with the sheriff, who happens actually to be a champion uh, in this area. We have something uh, that's unique in some ways called the DART team, uh, Drug Abuse Response Team. And these individuals go out when somebody has had an overdose, and they are officers, uh, but they actually try to get the person to go into treatment as an uh, alternative to uh, going to jail. So that we have a DART team, we have, uh, you know, the police chief is really involved. We met with him, we met with the health commissioner, the health education team there, the coroner's office, mental health agencies, first responders, recovery services, community members, school leaders, because we were thinking, you know, what's going on in the school, faith-based leaders. And with this, all of these areas have some unique uh I guess, additions to the opiate crisis. When you look at their role and then what role does the opiate crisis play on them? For example, there's a, a great movie documentary uh, that's called uh, Recovery Boys and uh, Heroin. If you ever get a chance, I'll talk about this in just a minute. It's Elaine Sheldon is the um, uh, producer of these documentaries. Well, the one uh, documentary, Heroin, talks just about West Virginia and how this one police chief responds to basically 15 or more overdoses every day, and then the next day is the same thing, and the next day is the same thing. So what impact does that mentally, stress-wise, uh, have on uh, that first responder? Or even for some of these, it could be workplace danger. We've had several law enforcement in my region officers who uh, have basically overdosed from coming into contact with things like fentanyl. You know, they put paraphernalia in their car as evidence, and next thing you know, it becomes aerosolized, and they have to administer Narcan to themselves. So um, I want to be clear, something to think about is not just about the opiate epidemic on the people that are using and their families, but about all the people that are in the pipeline that provide support, recovery, treatment, et cetera, for them. So in joining, kind of creating this collaborative, 
we used, if you've heard the term snowball technique. So basically asking other people for names of other people that we could add to our collaborator list. Uh, we sent out mass emails asking if people were interested in joining our partnership, our task force, or to uh, forward the invitation to others. We then began to develop monthly meetings uh, that expanded the Opiate Task Force. Uh, and actually, eventually, we, we've renamed it to the UT Community Partner Task Force. And that became really important because in for those of you that work near universities, it, sometimes we get criticized for taking over things. And we want to make it really clear, you know, this, this was more than just UT. This was everybody working together. So one of the first things that we did was uh, create a capacity assessment survey. And um, after a few times of meeting, we wanted to really look at what, what types of individuals that we have on our task force, what things could we maybe you know, involve them in, what was their interest area. So we actually asked uh, our group to do kind of an inventory survey or capacity assessment survey, asking them why did they join it? What topics are they interested? What kind of subcommittees uh, would they be interested in? Everything from education and awareness, treatment, recovery, enforcement, drug storage, data monitoring. Uh, so that was kind of an interesting way to look at it. Additionally, we asked, what big ideas would you like uh, to share with us that we might want to take on collaboratively? And then what are strategic planning? What are the top three areas that we think, or that you think we should focus on for the next years? And then how can we possibly uh, increase involvement with our task force? So um, these are just some things to give you some ideas. If you were gonna form a coalition or a task force, you know how would you go through these steps and how would you make it really so it's driven by your group and, and not just from the leaders of the coalition. So some of our successes, I think we were first charged with this in November 2017. One of the very first things we did, and this is a picture from it, is we had an opiate summit and we invited people from the community, people from the governor's office, from you know, law enforcement, faculty, um, everybody we could. We, I think we had 150 people there. Um, just to present the, the challenges we have in our region around opiates and some of the resources we have, and we wanted to start to connect people with one another. We also had, working with our allied health folks, uh, a College of Nursing Pain Management Symposium to educate clinicians on safe and responsible uh, prescriptive drug uh, use and prescribing. We then also began to create work groups of people that uh, we could get to, you know, kind of network and share resources and ideas. Uh, we created an expertise database. Um, one of the things we found out at our own institution was there was not really a listing of people with expertise in various areas. So we had to do that by hand. And then we actually created a uh, opiate task force website that the web address is listed there. So you're welcome to look at that in terms of how we started to um, get the word out on what we're doing and how people can get involved and join the task force. So I wanna highlight just some ideas of some things that you could do in the community and things that we've been able to uh, accomplish. I'm sure some of you are doing way more than what we're doing, but we're, we're in the infancy on this. But um, obviously a lot of the success of the opiate epidemic is gonna be tied to funding. Um, we are lucky in our state that we've gotten a good chunk of dollars towards this, but um, we've had legislative visits in Washington uh, one of our champions, well, I guess actually both of our state senators, Sherrod Brown and uh, Rob Portman, have been very open and receptive to meet about how to tackle these issues. Our new governor, uh, Mike DeWine, is actually uh, very interested in, in working on this issue. Uh, Marcy Kaptur, who actually is one of the longest uh, in office House of Representatives uh, at the federal level, has, we've met with her. Uh, one of the other things we began to do is um, UT 
and the community gives funding for a needle exchange clinic and we're in the process of doing a study to look at this is actually pretty interesting um, when people come in and exchange their needles uh, ask them to voluntarily participate in a study where we're able to analyze what is in the needle that they're exchanging as well as uh, to take a hair sample from them so the reason is this there's a lot of times people will come in and say yeah i use heroin and they will test either their hair or their needles and find out that what they're taking is not even heroin so one of the things we wanted to look at and we're, we're in the process of working at that is um, you know perception versus reality on what people are using So some of the task force successes, again, uh, we one of our uh, goals was to kind of get people to apply for funding and grants collaboratively with the community. So we've been pretty successful with some grants. Um, if you're not familiar with the Cardinal Health Foundation, we actually got a, a grant to do uh, prevention education with um, grades fifth through eighth and, in the community and also do a, a parental education component and you know it, i know we get a pushback sometimes when people saying fifth through eighth grade really that's too young we're seeing in the literature now that people are even starting opiate education in kindergarten now also uh, we were able to get some funding to take some of our um, faculty to a statewide opiate conference uh, we were able to get uh, a samsa grant award which was funded for $375,000 to do mental health first aid training, if you're familiar with that, both in our community and our campus as a way of helping dealing with people in crisis uh, who then may also turn to drug use. Uh, also as part of that is green zone training to, to work at um, helping our, our military individuals more effectively. Uh, we've submitted, if you're not familiar with Generation RX, uh, that's another resource that they provide lots of educational materials. Uh, we were trying to actually get some opiate education on our college campus. Uh, we've also uh, put in a number of abstracts, and I'll talk about this in just a second, that were accepted as well. This is just some of our faculty and myself and the uh, other coordinator of the task force where we, we were able to take 12 people down uh, to our large opiate conference. And again, most of us, this was our very first time doing anything uh, in the area of opiates. And what's neat about this, if you look at this group, uh, the, the woman on the far right, uh, Maggie Maloney, she's an OT. Uh, the person behind her is in economics. Uh, you know, I'm in public health. Uh, Cheryl McCollum Smith, Dr. McCollum Smith, is in psychiatry. And Dr. Dean Lewandowski is the dean of nursing. So you can see how this is really an interprofessional. Um, effort to try to address this issue. One of the other things that when we first took this on was we realized that there was no Narcan on our campus. <laughs> so, and this was an interesting um, project because of the fact that, um, you know, many of us that are in public health are very well aware of the benefits of Narcan. For some people, they see it almost like some people view condom usage. Like, well, if you have condom usage or condoms and you give them out, you know, in schools, for example, that increases usage. Well, we know that that's not a great argument. Uh, it's the same thing that we would get from Narcan. Well, if we give out Narcan, doesn't that increase uh, opiate issues or doesn't that um, mean that we have a problem here? We really don't have a problem here. Uh, so we had to do a lot of advocacy on this. Um, we first started out with getting our law enforcement just to be able to carry it on campus. And when I had my hat on as the faculty senate president, I, I guess it would be two years ago, um, that was one of my initiatives was to, you know, get Narcan on our campus. And, you know, then it was like, well, could we get it in the dorms? Could we get it in the library? You know, could we get it? It was very incremental and we had to convince people that if you give Narcan uh, and nothing, nothing will happen unless you truly need it. So this was, you would think this would have been a very easy process. This was not. Um, and the other fact about this is, although we've been able to educate over 400 faculty, staff, and students on Narcan, Narcan is really expensive. 
And for us, we were able to get some uh, kits do donated from the health department, but these are usually about $65 a kit. So, you know, if you want to get 400 kits to give out to people within your community, you know, that's going to cost lots and lots of money. And um, although there are some very small grants for this, most of the Narcan kits are through Project Dawn. Uh, that go to first responders or go to health departments and not other agencies. So it's a challenge for us has been able to actually um, find and locate and apply for uh, enough Narcan to be able to continuously train people. So some of the other things that we've done, um, again, I would encourage if you're doing something similar to this, always involving uh, people in a uh, faith. So we've uh, basically been out there at Community Faith Day talking about opiate prevention. We did a screening on our campus for the community and the college campus on the recovery boards where uh, we worked with the Honors College who had funding for a distinguished lecturer to come in. And she came in and uh, basically sh showed the movie and then did a discussion afterwards. And then the next day we showed her other movie, uh, basically uh, did a, a partial screening of heroin and talked about the, the issue of coping with the toll of responding to opiate overdose with police, fire, um, you know, clinical people, et cetera. And we've also done some work with, uh, in the area of aging, uh, there's is something in our area called the Optimal Aging Institute, and we partnered with them in Bowling Green, as well as the Wood County, uh, which is the county next to us, uh, Com Committee on Aging. And we had a town hall meeting that we talked about opiate misuse and addiction among older adults. And I will tell you in your community, if you don't see a lot of efforts in the area of, deal of this with older adults, this is a huge issue, and I really encourage you to look into that and to see what's being done in your community for that. I'll tell you one really quick story while Tiffany uh, switches uh, the, the slides. We even heard of uh, a couple older adult people who had limited mobility. And uh, one convinced a drug dealer to continuously deliver this older person who was homebound uh, pizza, and I'm using that word in quotation, where every week they deliver pizza to her apartment, which basically had heroin uh, in it. Then we've also heard of people literally, you know, taking their um, walkers out uh, to, to find a drug dealer on the street to be able to purchase uh, heroin. So very, very interesting. We've also tried to create a lot of media awareness about this issue. So um, we've had lots of uh, articles, TV interviews, um, local shows uh, that have covered our work. And that's been really, really good because we found partners as a way uh, to join us this way. So I really recommend using social media and the, the media in general to get let people know what you're doing and that you're open to partnering. And this just happens to be a, a picture that the, the uh, Toledo Blade ran in the paper with us in an article that we were interviewed for. I mentioned before that even though we've only been doing this for uh, about a year or so, that we've been able to get some presentations out of this. So again, if you're an academic, um, you always are trying to do service, but you want to link it to scholarship. So uh, these are just examples of a couple of the presentations that we've had. Uh, we presented, it, if you're familiar with the area of human trafficking, uh, at UT we actually have one of the national experts on human trafficking and we have an international human trafficking conference in September. And a lot of the grants that we're seeing now that are being provided actually will say, um, if you're going to write, you'll get kind of double bonus points on your grant reviews if you can create an element or linkage to human trafficking and opiates. And in fact, I'm actually writing an article on this right now that I was asked to for a journal. Um, so that's something to be thinking about as well in your communities. Who could you reach out to that might have a relationship with human trafficking? Um, Actually, exactly what I'm talking to you about now, uh, lessons learned uh, from a newly created needle exchange program. 
Uh, that's some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, also, you know, creating coalitions and how to address uh, the epidemic. I will be, if any of you are coming to the March Sophie meeting in Salt Lake, uh, I will be presenting a very similar version of this live and in person <laughs> uh, at that conference. So what's our next steps? Um, we're going to continue to engage with community partners. Uh, we continue to grow what we're doing, finding new people all the time. You know, it's interesting, people will send us stuff like, oh, look, there's an opiate you know, conference in your community and we've never even heard of these people. So you know, immediately we reach out and try to see how we can work together. Uh, we're trying to continuously engage faculty in collaborative research and scholarly projects that benefit our region. So every meeting we have with the community, we try to bring um, grants that come our way to try to get people to partner on them. Two of our newest uh, big projects I'm really excited about is a community uh, uh, opiate expo. And we're gonna have this in April at the University of Toledo where we're gonna invite any agency basically to be a vendor. Uh, about their resources. So it could be, you know, the Sheriff's Department, it could be um, Racing for Recovery, which is a, a group that uses physical activity to substitute for addiction. Um, it could be the Health Department. And we're gonna also, in conjunction with this, do community Narcan trainings and also have a track for CEUs, limited CEUs, uh, in the areas of social work, nursing, counseling. So that people that come uh, that want to can basically pick up three or four uh, CEUs in their area. And then we're also working on a community-wide teach-in. We actually got this from several other institutions that have done this, where it's the university working with, you name it, anybody and anyone in the community to create kind of a resource packet for different populations. So it could be um, K through 12, it could be the university, it could be, um, you know, Jeep, we have Jeep here. Uh, it could be Owens Corning, and basically having all this information in a media blast and asking people for, you know, five or 10 minutes of their day at their workplaces to talk about the issue of opiates and the resources uh, that we have in our community or, prevention-based programs. Uh, also having the, the mayor basically issue a proclamation uh, that this is something that's important in our community. So I really like this idea because it, it's, it really draws regional attention to this issue and it gets everybody doing the same thing at the same time. If you're at a university, um, you know, we could basically uh, get every faculty member to try to at least talk about opiates for you know, five minutes, and you know, that's a win for us. So, next slide. Other next uh, steps that we're working on is examine ways to increase access to needle exchange programs and transitional housing. These are some priorities for us. Um, many of you know that, you know, let's say you decide you're going to go into detox. Well, that's usually a three day process, and then what? you go right back to your house or to your friend group or to your environment that often promotes using uh, drugs. And so we're trying to look at ways to get transitional uh, housing during recovery. Um, I heard a, a recent speaker speak that it can take uh, up to 36 weeks for your brain to chemically return back to normal from using opiates. So this is something that requires a lot of help and assistance to really remain uh, free from opiates, and it could affect your job, your family, your your financial resources. Uh, so really trying to get people to have an opportunity for transitional housing. Also with needle exchange programs, we only have two sites in Toledo. We have, uh, you know, in the surrounding area, probably 400,000 people in Toledo, two needle exchange programs, or at churches, basically. And we'd love to see us be able to create a mobile unit that could go out into different zip codes and use social media to tell people where they can go to find. We have people come in that will bring 100 needles. Um, so there's clearly a need in our community for this. We also want to continue to increase access to Narcan on our campus and in the community. 
And as I mentioned before, uh, the role of mental health first aid uh, in green zone training. So what are some of the challenges that we've had uh, for this? First of all, you know, people like to be in their lane and they like to do what they do. And so there has been some overlap of our task force work with other community groups. Sometimes that can lead to kind of territorial issues. Some of this is not unique to the work of coalitions or, or task force. Um, one of the things that's been really hard for us is we're not really funded as a task force. So just to have somebody to help organize the Opiate Expo, we don't have a person. This basically becomes uh, the dean or myself as a vice provost, and we, we already have a pretty full plate on, in terms of our workload. Um, you know, we're trying to, we have an opiate expo, and we're like, uh, we don't have any money just for refreshments for stuff like this, and, you know, to try to find sponsorship and such, or just printing of materials to be able to, you know, go out and showcase some of our work. There's not really a budget for this. Um, also, we've noticed that there's distress from the community, you know, especially with our work with the needle exchange. You know, is this something I'm going to get in trouble for? Am I going to get the police called on uh, on me because of this? Um, you know, often with universities, there's this perception that we're going to ride in on a white horse and take what we need in terms of data and then go away. And it's really important to work and be accountable for the things that you say that you're gonna do and follow through on them and develop those really important community relationships. You might be doing everything right, but people around you might not. And you know, unfortunately that has a ripple effect when you ask people to help or work with you at an institution that there just tends to be some distrust there. Uh, I mentioned things like staff time, you know, having somebody to up, uh, update the web page, for example, um, becomes really challenging. And then, as I mentioned before, just even being able to identify potential expertise in the area, it took us a good six months of talking to people, asking people uh, to find out at our university who are the right people that we should be inviting to the table. So lessons learned um, from any experience, we're always learning. Uh, many of you know that co coalition building, it takes an enormous amount of time, but I always say it's really the pulse of public health. This is what we do. I don't care if the issue is gun violence prevention. Uh, I don't care if it's you know teen pregnancy, whatever it is, partnerships, that's not easy. It's not easy at all, but that's what creates sustainability. You know, if I go away tomorrow or the Dean of Nursing goes away tomorrow, we need to make sure that there's people beside us uh, that can take the reins and be able to continue the work. Uh, this, you know, especially finding collaborators and, and resources, it takes a long time. Uh, resources and marketing and communication are a must to be successful. We actually uh, have had to have several meetings about this because, you know, again, how do we convey to the community what we're doing? Um, you know, how do we how do we maintain websites? How do we have social media around this issue? So that's a, a big issue when you're looking at the community. Who has resources for that? How can you work with the media? In fact, the community teaching that we're doing, one of the things that we'd ask is the local media to help us make some short vignette videos. Uh, just to help us with that. Discuss upfront potential territorial issues. Um, you know, interesting enough, we started doing Narcan training and people are like, well, wait, you don't do Narcan training. And it's like, well, yeah, we can do Narcan. We have pharmacy people. We have, you know, people that have great expertise in it. And, um, you know, it, a lot of the agencies are so overbooked and doing their own Narcan trainings that, um, you know, it would take weeks or months to get them to be able to do that. So sometimes there's territorial issues. Uh, try to make sure that you have um, stakeholders that can contribute to a budget for your task force, or maybe there's membership dues, or uh, may, you know, thinking creatively of how you might be able to apply for a grant to get some funding uh, for your task force. And the thing we've learned with this is you can't be everything to everyone. You know, some people want you to do X or some people want you to do Y, but again, um, you don't have the resources to do that. 
And so there's some areas we've just not been able to really touch or address because we just have not had the expertise or the manpower. There's one area, for example, that we've not really started to tackle too much, but it's the area of pregnant moms and those that are uh, addicted. We have a couple hospitals in the region that have what's called a mom's program uh, that focuses on, uh, you know, trying to get the, the baby delivered healthy and then the mom into recovery. I mean, there's just some issues that we don't, we don't have the expertise or the scope to be able to start to uh, engage in. So that really kind of brings my uh, piece to a closure in terms of what we've been doing and just some ideas for you. And uh, I wanted to specifically leave a little bit of time. We have about 15 minutes left, uh, hoping that you might have questions or you know ideas or things that you want to share about the work that you're doing in your community or if this information uh, helps you at all. So Tiffany, I'm going to let you go ahead and I guess open it up to uh, discussion. Okay, great. Um, looks like we do have a question. Um, do you think applying for grants would have been beneficial? Yeah, that's a great question, Gal. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> you know, and obviously we have been successful in getting several grants, but you know, unfortunately. There's just a lot of uh, stipulations about what certain money can go to. In fact, it was an interesting discussion. We have um, this mental health first aid grant where we have to have, if you know anything about this, it's, it's kind of hardcore. It's about eight hours of training for people to be in this training. So that's a whole day. You got to feed these people, right? Well, the grant only allows for like $2 a day to feed people. Well, okay. And we're supposed to train like, almost 500 people and and so we wrote as much as we could in for the grant but you know we basically uh, have thousands of dollars of, of food that we probably will need to supply them in the form of you know lunch <laughs> you can't really feed anybody for two bucks especially on a university campus where we have catering issues and, and things like that so you know there's just a lot of things that we although we get some money for you know they're not going to necessarily cover things like printing of materials or you know web maintenance and things like that so it's just hard sometimes to be able to to get a designated funding for the things that you really need that's a great question thank you is there any more questions that anyone has for dr thompson i'd love to hear you know how some of this compares to what you all are doing or, or interested in We do have another question. With the needle exchange program, do you know if the other drugs found in testing were known by the user? Example, them not reporting correctly? That's a great question. There's, and there's a lot of articles published on this. Really, the, the user has no idea sometimes. Like, they think they're taking heroin and their stuff is testing positive for bath salts. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's one woman, there's a, a case study where she thought she's like I've been using heroin for 20 years and you know they took a, a hair follicle sample and uh, of her and she didn't even test positive for heroin so I don't know exactly what she was taking but um, yeah I mean that's kind of that's even crazy right you think you're this habitual heroin addict and for 20 years and you've not even really been using heroin right so Gail says, I have a question about the three strikes you're out. Is that a violation of basically uh, EMT, EMTALIA and EMS doesn't respond? So that's been an interesting question. Um, that sheriff took a lot of heat for that because, you know, what, what about the Hippocratic Oath, right? Um, what about being able to respond? But here's the issue, you know, when you only have, in, in fact, our EMS and uh, fire and uh, police budgets have just taken a huge hit for this because it's overtime, it's response. I mean, if you only have, you know, I'm making this up, you know, 10 police officers and, you know, eight of them are going out on, you know, heroin related uh, calls all the time, you don't have anybody to respond to other things. In fact, it's, it's a well-known um, thing here in Toledo that, 
basically there's some things like if your car gets broken into, they won't, the police won't even come out for that anymore, right? So I, I, there's just, they've kind of went to more of the essential services and, you know, not doing some of the things that, um, you know, you would, might expect that they should or would be able to do, right? And then becomes the idea of, well, can we save somebody that this is their first or second time versus their 15th time? You know, again, if you've never watched, and I'm not saying I'm defending that by any means, but this is kind of the conversation. Um, if you watch the the show um, Recovery Boys and Heroin, which are these two documentaries that are both on, on Netflix I'm referring to, you know, they'll both reference the fact that you know, it's not uncommon to have went out to somebody's house sometimes two or three times in the same day. In fact, what happens is after you, if many of you might know this, after you administer Narcan, you know, the person comes up, it comes out, they're usually um, angry and agitated because they're going through Im immediate withdrawal, okay? And for some people, they're really aggravated because they're like, look what I did to try to get the money to be able to purchase this, and now you have ruined my buzz. But uh, what happens is the way that your receptors are in your brain, that you are actually more likely to overdose, substantially more likely, if you've used Narcan and then you use uh, an, an opiate in the next you know, 24 hours, you're way more likely to overdose. So it's kind of this vicious cycle where you could be going out to somebody's house and come back, you know, two, three hours later for the same reason. So you can see how these first responders are becoming really, really frustrated with that, right? So I'm reading a question. Uh, I have to say it's nice in a way to hear that the issues are facing your community and addressing issues is similar to what we are seeing in IA. Yes, and I, and I agree with you. I mean, <clears throat> these are challenges we're seeing everywhere, and a lot of it you know, just depends on the level of resources that you have. Um, for those of you that are, um, you know, at institutions, uh, uh, universities, you know, my my push is to really look outside of the institution and work more with community partners on this. It, it, you know, we can't be in the ivory tower on this and make a huge difference. And, you know, especially when you have the opportunity to impact, you know, locally, regionally uh, your community and, and with all the experts and resources that you have. Yep. So Gail says that it would be nice for them to have a safe place to go. Thanks for your hard work on this. Yeah, and again, the other issue is I would be curious in your areas if you have transitional housing because that's very expensive. It's hard to maintain. But, you know, one of the, the in the documentary Recovery Boys, it actually follows these three boys that were put into a residential program. They tried so hard to get clean and, or, or excuse me, to remove from addiction. And basically, um, they went and worked on this farm. It was really interesting. They have some like kind of programs to keep their mind off the addiction. And so uh, they left their home and went to actually work on this farm, you know, that was manual labor as a way. I mean, there's, so there's some really interesting, uh, w you know, ways that people have went to try to help people uh, with transitional housing. You know, the other thing I thought was really interesting, and this, I've never seen anything like this, is when I was out at APHA and I was presenting on our needle exchange program, um, there's been huge pushback on needle exchange programs in some communities because uh, one community in particular said it was a political issue that they were exchanging these needles and there were so many needles that people were finding them, and this was in California, on the beaches, you know, and, you know, all over in garbage cans, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, those are big issues. The other thing to think big picture for those of you that are doing any work with human trafficking is to try to, you know, if you're working on identifying people that are human trafficked, also there tends to be that relationship between opiate addiction and human trafficking. So for clinicians trying to pick up on that relationship, you know, there's a lot of, Ohio, by the way, as you know, has um, one of the bigger areas for human trafficking. So we would see people basically uh, being controlled by opiates as a way of continuing in their um, human trafficking. So if you're addicted, you need the drug, right? So you, you know, keep 
doing what you're doing as a way to get that drug. Right? So any other last questions before we wrap up here? Maybe one more if anybody needs anything. I hope that this really gave you some ideas of what you can do in your communities. We have so much work to do with this and it really does take a village uh, to make a difference with this. And, and all of you have different expertise that you can bring to the table that uh, can make a difference in your community. So thank you so much for having me. I hope it gives you some ideas. Uh, I am at the University of Toledo. Uh, you can feel free to contact me if you want to chat or if you're going to be at the National SOFI conference. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'll be presenting basically on this issue again uh, come April. Thank you so much. That was very informative. I think we all learned a lot. Um, I just want to remind everyone that um, members can receive CHES and MCHES credits for today. If you're not a member, we're always welcome to join. Um, if you'd like to pay for credits, you can make um, a payment on our Iowa SOFI website. Um, in order to receive credits, you will need to complete an evaluation. So I'll be sending out a, an email after this webinar with a link to the evaluation. Um, but we would like everyone to complete the evaluation regardless of whether or not you're seeking credits. So the link is on the screen right now, and also you'll find it in your email shortly. Thank you again, Amy. I really appreciate your, your time today. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Take care.